Right, Blackie. Um, it's been 20 years since you released uh, your debut album with uh, Wasp. When you made this album, uh, did you ever think that you still would be making Wasp albums 20 years later? We were hoping to get 20 months, not 20 years. You know, looking back on it, I've had the last probably four or five months to reflect on it because the first half of this year we were still working on the records for the Neon God. But the last few months since we've been on tour I've had time to really sit and reflect and in all honesty I think when you first get a record deal you're standing at the threshold of everything you've worked for and that's really all you can see at that moment. I mean you're now in the game because people and I, I assume it's probably the same in other places in the world but they think you know once you've played a few local shows and you know a band starts to do well in in their their local region that they've made it you haven't made anything you know you're not even in the game until you get a record deal and once you get a record deal then we determine or then it will then be determined what sort of um, career numbers you're going to have. You know, it's just like a sport. <clears throat> and, you know, equating it to American baseball, you're not even up to bat, you know, until you actually get a record deal. So then that's when we find out what's going to happen. So when you first get a record deal, you're just so happy to be in the game. You're not thinking about a batting average. You're just happy just to be you know in the big leagues you know and then after you're there for a while then the idea of really starting to compete that then starts to become uh, the next level that you go on to but when you first get a record deal I don't think anybody seriously entertains the idea of truly being able to compete with the Pink Floyds of the world or the Beatles or anything like that. that that's too overwhelming. That's that's royalty. That's the, you don't even aspire to that. You know, you're just trying to get in the game. The very beginning was actually uh, the single, Animal, I Felt Like a Beast. That single didn't make it to the album. Uh, was that the intention in the first place, to, to put it uh, on the album? We wanted it on the album, but there was a problem with EMI in England. And they, there was a, a huge controversy that the local government there had threatened the EMI officials that if they put that single on the record, they were going to go to jail. So we they were then understanding enough to step aside and let us put it out on a on an independent label and to my knowledge that's the first time that a major record label has ever stepped aside and allowed an artist to go with an independent label after they had been signed you know I'd, I I've never heard of that happening before but it was such an unusual unusual situation that um, they said, yeah, they, they, basically they were saying they didn't want any part of it. That was their way of, of dealing with it. Your debut album is, uh, well, it's a classic, it's a, it's a very good album, and, uh, well, you, you got your sound already then. Uh, did it take long for you to, to find uh, the Wasp formula, your, your own style, your own sound? No, it, when people think of us as a band, you know, they think of the visual presentation, and they think, you know, the first few records, and what have you, but... And I've told this story before, but it, it bears repeating that when we first started, we were not going to perform live. We were trying to get a record deal. And living in Los Angeles, we knew that 
trying to play live didn't get you anywhere. You know, the record labels were interested in demo tapes. And um, so what we did is the guitar player and myself, Chris Holmes, we had had a band called Sister prior to Wasp. And Sister was basically Wasp with a different name. We looked the same, sounded the same. And I had written what, in between the time of Sister and when Wasp got together, I had written what ended up being the majority of what the first album would be, you know, Love Machine and On Your Knees, I Want to Be Somebody. <coughs> and so we were going to go in and just record. We were never, we never had any intention of playing live because we thought playing live is not going to get us anywhere, not in Los Angeles. So we went in and we recorded and we did a couple of sets of demos and they actually they turned out to be very very good looking back on them right now those early demos which ended up being the majority of what the first album was those original demos are better than the first album yeah oh yeah there's there's a rawness to them there's a there's an intensity to them that we even the first album which is now seen as a classic there's an intensity on those demos that the first album never was able to achieve. Um, I think it was probably because we had done many different versions of them. By the time we got to actually recording the first album, we were ready to move on to the second thing, you know. So I think we had maybe lost a little of the intensity of recording those songs. We're going to put out a box set, an anthology, sometime in the future sometime in the near future I don't know exactly when you know we were hoping for this this coming summer but I don't know if that's gonna happen or not but um, when that happens all those early demos are gonna be part of that and people are gonna hear what we're talking about you know because there's just there's an intensity and a, and a ferocity to those early demos that's just we were never able to duplicate but when we were recording those or even before we were recording when I was writing <coughs> I had an idea to do a basic two-part harmony, which was basically what I used to refer to as Electric Everly Brothers, you know, which was what Lennon and McCartney had done with the Beatles. You know. But nobody had ever done it with a heavy rock band before. And so the idea of a basic, in musical terms, it's what's called a fourth and a fifth or four-five harmony, you know, basic two-part harmony. Uh, we were just going to, that was going to be the signature sound. And if you go back and you listen to the vast majority of our songs, even to this day, the choruses have that in common. They're two-part harmonies almost all the way through. And so that was the foundation of what we were working on. And then, once those demos were recorded, we, we weren't getting any responses from the record companies, and we started to get kind of bored, and we thought, well, you know, we think these songs are pretty good. Why don't we take them out in front of people and see what happens? And then at that point, we decided on a name, because even when we were recording the demos, we didn't have a name, you know? So we wanted a name that was controversial without really being controversial. So that's where the idea of the periods came in behind each letter you know no band had ever done that before and we thought you know if we do this it'll probably drive people absolutely crazy you know and it did you know it worked far better than we ever imagined that it could have and so that worked out well and then the show just kind of eventually evolved over you know the course of maybe 10 shows you know and that was done basically out of our own boredom you know uh, a quest to entertain ourselves not so much the audience you know so it was you know people I think you know the legend has it that you know it was some big mastermind plan from the beginning of how we would look and how the show would be and all it wasn't that way I'd love to take credit for it but it, it was not like that it just eventually evolved out of recording sessions to do demos that was basically the first album we were making a big noise in Los Angeles. I mean, we had already in, a, in an 11-month period from the time that we did our first show, we started out at the Troubadour in Los Angeles, 8 o'clock on a Tuesday night. And considering that they're closed on Monday nights, that's the worst spot in the week. We worked out what we played two Tuesdays in a row, 
and then we went to a Wednesday, and then to a Thursday, and then to a Friday, and then a Friday and a Saturday, and worked our way up, and we eventually left there within about three months and moved on to bigger venues. In an 11-month period from the time we did our first show at the Troubadour, we had worked our way up to the Santa Monica Civic there, which was 3,000 seats, all without a record deal, didn't have a manager. But even then, we had already been on the cover of four international rock magazines. You know, So we were making a big noise, and record companies were watching us very closely. But it really wasn't until Rod came into the picture that he then looked at what we had created and then Rod kind of was like over the top of it. He could see where it needed to go because he had already walked this path before with Iron Maiden. So he knew where to take it and where to put it. And it was Rod's idea to do the single for the 12-inch for, for Animal, for Fuck Like a Beast, because when EMI said they didn't want to release it, I thought, well, then that's it. That song's going to get buried. And Rod said, uh-uh. You know, life gives you lemons, you make lemonade, we'll take this and we'll go a whole different direction. That was entirely his idea. And as a matter of fact, even the title of the song, it was his idea to subtitle it Fuck Like a Beast because it had that, I mean, the song, as you know it today, had all those lyrics with the Fuck Like a Beast part in it. But I, I'd never dreamed that that would be that sound bite that people were looking for. See, he could see it like a consumer. I couldn't. I was looking at it from a songwriter's point of view. From, from my point of view, the song was called Animal. And that's all there was to it. Releasing that song as just the original title would have never had the impact that it did had he not said, take that catchphrase lyric, stick it into the title, and then we'll release it like that. So, I mean, he was, he was huge. As, as you probably as remember, we were career. banned from playing in Norway for the first few years, you know. And we found that strange because to us, only the most notorious of bands got banned. You know, when we first came to Europe, we got banned in Ireland, we were banned in Norway. You know, and oddly enough, it, it was only until about three years ago we played the the last and final place we had been banned from which was las vegas nevada of all places the sodom and gomorrah the western hemisphere you know so we've finally gotten into all these places but it, it took a long time because the reputation was was so powerful and it frightened parents so much you know that they just they looked at us and they said no we're not going to have this uh, they didn't let you play here on the uh, Inside the Electric Circus uh, tour, and then your your stage show wasn't the same. You didn't have that raw meat. Yeah, but you know you can't tell people that. They, you know they don't watch you from time to time, or from year to year. They're only seeing what or what they've heard about from a few years before. You know, so we had already started to evolve at that point, but they didn't understand that here.
the year after your debut, you released another studio album, The Last Command, with a new drummer. It's it's a very good album. It's a bit different. I mean, you don't have those uh, sing-along choruses anymore. Uh, why did it turn out that way? Well, I think as far as sing-along choruses, I think you know, Wild Child and Blind in Texas are probably as strong as anything that was on the first album. But it took me till maybe just the last six or seven months to understand what our first album was because it was written you know I was like 25 26 years old and I did not understand I wasn't trying to analyze my writing I was just writing and once that was done that first album was completed our lives changed radically quickly and by the time we got ready to do the second record we weren't the same band anymore but I wasn't trying to fight that you know I was going with the growth pattern looking back on the first album <clears throat> I think what made it what it was was that it appeared to be very upbeat you know I wouldn't say rock and roll party but there was a an enthusiasm to it an energy to it but at the same time there was a dark overtone to it and that was something that I was not aware of until just like I said the last six eight months you know where I've had time to really think about you know because I, I listen to people talk about that first album and there's a reverence for it and I, and I used to think I never thought I want to be somebody was that good of a song you know what made that record what it was because as a creator if something's successful you look back and you say well how can I do that again you know well I wasn't thinking about it I was just reflecting who I was at that moment in my life so I better understand it now but by the time we got to the second record, like I said, we had changed radically as a band. We had already done a world tour. We had been exposed to big success quickly, and we were moving. I do think one the, the single biggest difference between the first record and the second record was that the record company, EMI, insisted that we use an outside producer because I did the first record largely myself, and it gave it a polished sound one that I wasn't ready for I was not really happy with it was just a little too polished sounding for where we were somebody said later it sounded like you went from your first album to your fourth album you know so I think that's probably the biggest difference but I do think you know there's a couple of songs on there that like I said Wild Child and, and uh, Blind in Texas that are that are still you know could have been on the first album. Uh, they were the singles and they're also the songs that you uh, usually do live from this album now. Does that mean they are your favorite tracks of the album? Yeah, I think so. Um, and just and consequently happened to be the ones that the audience picked up on as well. So, you know, I, that's just me being the consumer, you know, saying what would I want to hear, you know, if I was going to see that band. You made three albums in three years, uh, in the beginning. Uh, inside the Electric Circus, you played the guitar. Did that make uh, any difference? Was that important for you to, to pick up the guitar again? I'm a guitar player, but my original instrument is guitar. You know, I think like a guitar player. So when I was playing bass, I was, I was not the most comfortable. And people early on uh, identified with me playing bass but I just I resisted it you know we had in the very beginning of the band we had three guitar players and no bass player and I knew that those other two guys were not gonna play bass so I was reluctantly elected to play bass and um, you know it just ended up being something that 
that happened, but when I had the opportunity to go back to play guitar, I didn't hesitate. You know, it's what I wanted to do because singing lead and playing bass is difficult to do. You know, by playing guitar now, it allows me more freedom to do what it is I really do, you know. Um, but I've often said that that was a tired record done by a tired band. You know, I mean, we had, for four years, we had been on a very, very intense schedule. And I just, like I said, I, it sounds like a tired record to me. I think it's better now, you know, I listened to it a couple years ago. And I think it's better than what I originally gave it credit for, but it's not what we were capable of doing at that moment. Uh, there are two covers on this album. Um, did you record those? Uh, because, well, there was a lack of original uh, Wasp tracks. No, um, we always did covers because we, our contract, the way it was written, we didn't get paid for B-sides. We only got paid for the A-side, so we always did songs by other bands that we grew up with that we liked. Well, we did those two covers, especially the I Don't Need No Doctor, and we listened to it and we went, whoa, ho, ho, you know, maybe we have something here. And um, I think, you know, for me, that song's the highlight on the record, you know, and it's the song that we didn't write, you know, but it's my favorite track on it. The next record you released the year after um, your first live album. Um, I talked to you about this before, and uh, you're not very fond of that release. It too sounds very, very polished, you know, um, overdone. You know, when we had the chance years later on to do Double Live Assassins, you know, there's a rawness to that that I wish this first one would have had. But this too was all part of that hangover that we had of doing Inside the Electric Circus, you know, where we didn't have time to really stop and evaluate who we were. And um, I was just not happy with that period of my life and my career. And it had, looking back on the idea of Inside the Electric Circus, that's exactly what we had become. We had become a circus, you know, and that's not what I wanted to be. There are three new tracks on the album, but two of them are recorded live. Did you ever make uh, any studio versions of uh, the two tracks? That's Manimal and Harder Faster. No, no, we, we had intended to, but when we did the live versions, we just left them. Uh, your next album, Headless Children, is, uh, well, it shows a more serious um, side of Wasp. Well, I was pretty unhappy with the whole Inside the Electric Circus time frame, or time period. And Circus was a record, a tired record done by a tired band that didn't know who they were anymore. And we had gone from this little band 
not really even a band. You know, we were just a bunch of musicians that were in a recording studio trying to get a record deal. And then the next thing we knew, we were three years down the road, and we had not had time to stop to evaluate who we were, where we had come from, where we were going. That was the most important thing, was who were we and where were we going. And when we got ready to do this record, we took over a year to make it. And that's the luxury, that, or one of the luxuries that we had never had before because, you know, all those first few records were done in weeks, you know, not months or years. You know, and it was a young band being told by a record company, you got to get back out on the road really quickly because if you don't, they're going to forget about you and they're not going to remember who you are. And you believe that, you know, and you think, well, if I don't get out there, you know, my, you know, they're going to forget me and, you know, and it's all going to be over. Well, you know what? You keep making bad records and the only thing that's going to come to an end is your career, you know, because they'll have other bands out there to take your place, you know. So you get to a point where you say, okay, what's not right why don't i feel the same way i did when we first started because we were making we may had made a record that we didn't really believe in we were just pushing the buttons we were on automatic pilot you know we were just making product and that's when i became really like i wouldn't say completely anti-business but very much so, you know, I, I became, you know, a radical in the sense that I don't care what record companies say anymore. If I'm going to have no more music career, then that's okay with me because I'm not going to continue doing this like this. They had heard the early demos, EMI had, had heard the early demos for Headless, did, did not like it. You know, they said this is not sound like Wasp, it's not what's in the marketplace right now especially in America, you know, they said, this is not the record for you to make. And what they're saying is, do what you want, but if you fail, you're finished. Ended up being the biggest record we ever had, you know, and then they shut up, you know, when you do that. That record was the line in the sand for us. That separated us from all the other bands that had come out of L.A. in the 80s. Had we not made that record when we did, we would have gone down the toilet with all the rest of them when grunge happened in the early 90s. You know, but that record so far differentiated us from all of the rest of them. We were now in a category by ourselves. You know, probably the closest thing to us at that, that time would have been what Queens were, were doing. But we were probably the only bands that came from the West Coast that were breaking away from all that mold at that time. And that's the reason both of us survived. You did uh, your I Heap cover on, on um, Inside the Electric Circus album. And as far as I remember, uh, Ken Hensley helped you out pretty much on this album. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, he had played with Johnny Rod, our bass player, in a in a band previous to that. And so when we got, you know, because we, had, we were talking about, you know, the cover that we had done for that, Johnny said, well, you know, I know Ken, I used to play with him, you know. Maybe we get him to play on the record. So, you know, we talked to him and one thing led to another. And it ended up being a great collaboration. You know, we were very happy with it. And then you released um, a best of album just to uh, get out of the record deal you had uh, then. I uh, actually heard on MTV when you released First Blood, Last Cuts that this was the farewell album from Wasp. Uh, that wasn't the plan, was it? Well, that was, you know, for lack of a, a better term, in some ways was, as you said, to get out of a record deal. And um, it was not the only thing that was necessary to get out of that record deal. There was there was some other things that had to be done to get them to see it our way. But that was the beginning of it. That was the first thing to fulfill the contractual obligation. And then, still not black enough in '95. I've I've heard that this was also planned as a, a Black Lola soul album. Mm, I don't think so. I mean, that, that may just be rumor because I think once we had put that to rest with the Crimson Idol, we were we were content to leave it as was. But um, for me, a seriously underrated record. I mean, that that's a good record, you know. But it came in the wake of the Crimson Idol, and nothing was gonna survive that, you know. So 
it, uh, you know, we could have made Crimson Idol Part Two, and it wouldn't have mattered. You know, it's just like I, you know, going back and looking at it. <clears throat> you know, I think most bands that have done real milestone records, whatever they released thereafter, always suffered because of it. You know, it's it's inevitable. You know, it's just because whatever you do next is going to be immediately compared to that record before, and that's a no-win situation. Sad. years after Chris had left the band the Crimson Idol another milestone in your career I guess um, this is more or less a, a solo album isn't it I mean uh, Bob Kulik is there to help you you got two different drummers no bass player mm. well it's often been asked why call this wasp when it really wasn't our wasp record well we were going to not use the name of the band and then EMI did some research, you know, asking people what they thought. And they came back with a very interesting response. They said, that band is, that band being Wasp, that band is thought of in a similar sense, like maybe Motorhead, what Lemmy is to Motorhead, or Ian Anderson is to Jethro Tull. Everybody knows where the spirit of that band is. What difference does it make what you call it? If it's not broke, don't fix it, leave it alone. You know, so that's why we decided to leave it. Okay. Right, then finally, uh, a worthy Wasp live album, Double Live Assassins. Um, I don't know if there's much to say about this, but it's, it's a very great album. It speaks for itself, you know. It's, um, you know, the first one was called Live in the Raw. This one should have had that title because that's exactly what it is. You know, the mix on it was was done completely opposite. It was not designed to sound big. It was designed to make it sound like it was in somebody's bedroom. You know, a band just set up and played in there, and everything was, you know, very close. You know, and it's like it's designed to make it sound like you're sitting in the middle of the band on the stage, and that's that's the approach I wish we would have taken on the first one. That's a good record. Uh, did you shoot any video? Uh for this um i think that there is some we're going to do when we do the anthology we're talking about we're going to do this you know a video anthology as well so whatever footage we have will be in, involved in that
then Chris Holmes came back in the band and uh, he released a, a very different album, uh, Kill Fuck Die. It's got a very industrial touch to it. Did you go that direction to make something different because, well, still not Black Enough didn't do as well as you thought or as you hope it would? There was a couple of reasons for it. Number one, probably first and foremost, is the first time we came to Europe in 84, Chris and I went into a German disco. And we didn't we were just looking for girls. We didn't know what was in there. You know? And we heard this this music this <laughs> sound going. And it sounded like two big pieces of steel colliding, you know, like metal, you know, crashing together. And we thought, what is that? You know, we'd never heard anything like that before. And we always thought that sounds like metal. It sounds like two pieces of giant metal having a car crash or something like that, you know. But it, it's a beat, you know. They turned it into a, a drum beat. And that, that left a big influence on us. And then in the mid-90s, you know, some of these other bands, you know, were experimenting with this sound. And we thought, well, we had thought back to that thing that we always liked. And, they said, and we said, well, maybe now is the chance where we could do this. You know, so we went and we did that. I think from an imagery point of view, irregardless of, uh, and I understand that, you know, the reluctance in Europe to accept a record like this, you know, even though this record was, was by, especially with critics in America, they loved it, but um, I think from an imagery point of view, lyrically, there's no record we've ever done that's even close to this record. I mean, it, oh yeah, from an artistic point of view, it's a it's a very avant-garde artistic record, and there's nothing that we've ever done that's anywhere close to this. As a matter of fact, we're doing, in the show that we're doing now, we're uh, doing Kill Your Pretty Face, which we haven't done since we released this record. Eldorado uh, released in 1999. This was to, designed to be the anti-KFD because we had done KFD and you also have to remember when we did KFD, Chris and I had gone through really bad breakups. He had divorced Lita Ford and I had been in a relationship for three years that had come to an end that was really ugly and it's just, I wouldn't say we were anti-women at that point but we were anti-relationship at that point, you know just didn't want to know about anything for a while and once we got KFD out of our system we said okay the darkness that was KFD which I, I'd say you know in a similar sense with uh, what we just did with um, the Neon God there's a darkness to that record too that I, I and I don't know what we're gonna do next time but I would think it's probably gonna take more of an upbeat direction you know because we've done that you know and I don't like getting in one place and just staying there you know, that gets boring. Um, as far as I remember, this album got mixed critics, but uh, I think there are some some great tunes there as well. It's a good record. Let's move on to uh, to Unholy Terror. Um, you're a bit more serious again here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, you know, I mean, that's direct criticism, you know, at organized religion. You know, it's a, 
the front cover tells you that you know it's a Bible with bullet holes in it. You know, so it's uh, you know that makes just the front cover makes a hell of a statement alone. Then Dying for the World, another political album. I mean, uh, the September 11th incident uh, made you make this. Well, yeah, you know, it was in a lot of ways coming from the same direction that the Headless Children came from, where it was real social comment oriented. You know, I had gone to to Ground Zero just well. I'd I'd been down there a week before it happened. You know, I mean, literally was looking at those buildings, and I thought, well, I'm going to be back in a few weeks. And, um, you know, my team here, you know, was going to the World Series. People can't see it. I'm wearing a Yankee shirt right now. And I knew the Yankees were going to be in the Baseball World Series, so I was going to be back in a few weeks. And I had no comprehension of what I was going to not see when I got back there. And the, the day I got back, I went down to ground zero, and there's... There's nothing you will ever see in your lifetime that can prepare you for what that was, you know, and it's, it was just had a dramatic effect on me, you know, not just because I'm an American, <clears throat> but, you know, I grew up there, and when I was a kid, I could look out my bedroom window and I could see the trade centers. So for me, it was like somebody stole something out of my backyard. You know, it was a very personal attack. It wasn't just some sort of national, let's wave the, the American flag attack. It wasn't that for me. You know, I'm sure some of it was, but for me it was more personal than nationalistic. Then your current albums, uh, The Neon God Part One and Two. Um, you were supposed to release those as a double album, but the label didn't let you. Well, it wasn't that? Is retailers? Retailers won't take double records anymore. They'll take historical double record sets like um, uh, The Wall or something like that, you know. But they don't want to take new double records anymore. Their argument is, is it takes up too much rack space, and it's like, you know, hello, that's that's a lie. They want to they they want to maximize the amount of space. You know, if they've got 
two or three centimeters and the width of a CD, and you're telling me that that's that much extra space, I'm not buying it. it that you know, that's just another way for them to try to rip off the public. Well, anyway, it had to be released in two parts. The reason I, aside from you know people spending more money to get both parts, if we could just remove that idea for a second, the reason I don't like it is because to me it's one piece of work, and since part two has come out, part two is being compared to part one. It should not be thought of like that. It's one piece of work, and I know eventually after people live with both of them for a while, they'll see it as one piece but you know when I first started doing the interviews for part two they were invariably comparing it to part one I go well you're not supposed to it's all part of the same thing that's like taking one record and comparing side A to side B you know it's like it's not supposed to be like that and I knew this was gonna happen and then once it finally did happen then it angered me even more you know because it's I don't want people to think of it that way I've heard that you've been working on this uh, concept since uh, the Crimson Idol album well not exactly you know it was actually it started right around the time of uh, still not black enough as a matter of fact there's a song on uh, still not black enough that a portion of it made it on to uh, part two of the neon god and the reason I did that is because I like the idea of the song it's uh, on neon god it's called clockwork Mary and uh, still not black enough it's called um, I can't and I just when I started thinking of the magnitude of the, of the neon god I knew the Crimson Idol is a short story you know it's uh, it's it's much more intimate much more compact you know the whole idea of the neon god I knew would be this huge idea and I thought I just cannot face that right now and I thought well I have this song I can't well I'm just gonna use it now because I'm never gonna use it if I don't use it now we're well, wrong I you know eight years later I ended up using it but or a portion of it anyway but um, I just at the time after fin finishing the Crimson Isle I thought I just I cannot climb that mountain again right now and I mean I feel that same way now but even more so because I've done a double record set and if somebody asked me you're gonna do another concept record if I had to give somebody an answer I'd tell them no because there's just the, the, the amount of work that is in that is just oh, painful <laughs> Looking back on the last 20 years, are you are you happy with what you you have achieved and and where you are now? I've been enormously blessed. Um, you know, this goes back to the first question. You know, did you think you could do it? You don't even fantasize that. You don't allow your mind to go that that place. You know, it's just it's too unbelievable. You know, you're hoping to live 20 years, not just have a career. You know, um, like I said, I've been unbelievably blessed, and to I think the I always felt that when you first or, or when a band got started or an artist got started, that the mark of greatness was as we were talking about before. It only starts when you get into the game, when you start making real records. But then you measure greatness 
not by can you do a record or two or be there two or three years can you do it 10 years can you do it 15 can you do it 20 can you do it 30 you know that's where that mark of really leaving your mark comes in uh, I think that that's what it if you can do it wow you know it's um it's it's an achievement and I don't mean just for me I mean anybody that does it you know so um has it been everything I thought it was going to be a hundred times more than I thought it would be hey, Raising hell in Austin, just in the sun now. With the who's down, police decided to come round. They said, well, what's the matter with you? What you trying to do? I looked at the man and I said. Oh, oh boy, I think I'll have another one of these. You're dreaming, you're funny.